So uh, welcome to this uh, last module of the, the workshop, uh, labeled uh, Downstream Analysis and Online Tools. Um, first, I, I want to mention as, a, as we uh, presented ourselves on the, on, on the first day of the, wo the workshop, like um, a lot of what I do in, uh, in, uh, in my work is to organize data and make, make the data uh, like, um, Reusable, uh, reusable by others. Basically, uh, maybe you may you may have heard of uh, like the uh, the fair principles for data sets. How to make uh, uh, genomic and epigenomic data findable, accessible, interoperable, and uh, what was the R again? Uh, reusable. There you go. Uh, so, so like uh, lots of fancy terms uh, to just to say that uh, um, like. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, of work, <laughs> like once the data has been produced, to uh, make to organize it in ways uh, that uh, others can reuse it. So all the all of the data that's been generated, for instance, in the uh, by, by the International Human Epigenome Consortium, uh, once it's uh, once it's out there, once it's released in the public archives and those things, uh, some uh, resources and portals and databases and APIs need to Organize this data to make it uh, to to make it uh, discoverable and reusable by others. Uh, that's why, like a, a significant portion of, of this module, I will present tools, data sources, and things that are like rather than being more on the common line side, uh, are, are more uh, available online. So uh, we'll we'll cover. Well, I may have as well <laughs> uh, get out the uh, the uh, learning objective for this module. So first, we'll explore a few components of a downstream analysis that can be applied to uh, epigenomic assay data. Uh, but uh, as I was saying, like uh, we'll, we'll discover sources of publicly available data sets that can be used in your project. So like uh, it's one thing to generate data set and it's a lot of work. Uh, it, uh, and then you need to analyze it and analyze it, but like uh, to, uh, to get more uh, meaningful results, often we need like a, a very large data set size. And, and the, the, these data sets, uh, th th there's a lot of uh, public sources for uh, uh, genomics and epigenomic data sets that exist out there. So we'll we'll uh, cover a, a few of these sources. Um, we'll also talk about ident identifying challenges of uh, using public data sets in your own analyses. And uh, we'll learn about some online portals and tools that can uh, ease epigenomic data analysis. So uh, this module I'll outlined, uh, the, the sections are more or less corresponding to this. So first, downstream analysis tools. Um, we, we've seen in the past two days and a half, uh, like uh, ways to uh, analyze uh, epigenomic data at the level of chip seek, at the level of uh, whole genome bisulfite sequencing. So, uh, and of course, there's a, there's a whole lot of, uh, other assays that can be done at the level of transcriptomic with RNA seq, uh, 3D structure uh, uh, of the uh, of the DNA, etc. Et so uh, this information that we can get out of uh, these uh, these uh, these experiments once they've been uh, pre-processed, uh, we 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 of course want to uh, to put it in context to. Uh, to basically answer the question, uh, answer que specific questions that we're looking for. So uh, once, like as we've seen in the previous modules, once primary data analysis is completed for a given epigenomic assay, we have, for instance, at the level of ChIP-seq, a, a set of p-calls, uh, like the, the bed files that, uh, that, that we've seen. At the level of a whole genome bisulfate sequencing, we'll have methylation levels at various CPG sites and so on. Uh, so. Uh, this process data can be used to run some functional an analysis tools. Uh, there's many such tools, so here we'll cover two of them. One is uh, motif detection with Homer, and the other one being gene ontology uh, terms and term enrichments or, or, or Go term enrichments with GREAT. Uh, first of all, a little uh, introduction on motif detections. Uh, what are motifs? Uh, they are short recurring patterns in the DNA that are presumed to have a biological function. If we have a look at the uh, the, the, the the lower part of the slide, here's a like a 
a sequence of a, a, a of, of DNA. If we if you if you look at it carefully, you can identify that there are regions of this that are repeated multiple times. Um, like in, in the example, if we allow for a, a one base mismatch, there are two uh, distinctive motifs that can be observed here, and they're they're uh, ident they're uh, labeled in a specific color in in the text. So these sequence specific bionics, sometimes these can uh, indicate sequence specific bionic size for proteins such as nuclease and uh, transcription factors. So using uh, the, the uh, regions previously labeled as peaks, like the, 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 the big beds or the bed files that, uh, that we've got, uh, we can try to identify motifs. And, and we'll do that in the lab as well. We'll, we'll take one, uh, the result of one experiment from ENCODE for a chip seek on a, uh, for a transcription factor binding sites, and we'll try to identify uh, what uh, this might uh, relate to. So for that, we'll use Homer. Uh, Homer is a common line tool uh, th that we will be running on the uh, on your AWS instance. The uh, whoops, the goal of Homer is to uh, identify regulatory elements and which in one set of sequences as compared to another. So the uh, th this is a, a an, alg an algorithm that's like for a. Uh, DNA sequences. Uh, it, it has uh, its own database to uh, try to identify motifs that in the in the the, the uh, sequences that are provided uh, for uh, like known motifs in the database and try to uh, also identify de novo motifs. Uh, the, the software we will use, like Homer, comes with a, a bunch of uh, a, a bunch of tools. The one we will use is Find Motif Genomes, that attempts to identify motifs, as I previously mentioned. So the two inputs will be a bed file uh, containing the regions of interest. So that's that's the peak file and the reference genome as, assembly. Uh, we've covered this in the previous uh, lectures and, and and labs, but like a a a, a bed file uh, is a uh, basically a, a text file uh, with multiple columns. Um, like traditionally, like the, the, the uh, bed file can have a, a variable uh, number of, uh, of columns with variable content. Uh, there's a specific con uh, a structure that Homer expects to get in your bed file. Uh, and the, the, uh, the columns are, are, are identified here. So th these are the uh, Homer execution steps. Of course, there will be some kind of a uh, uh, smoke test uh, to validate that the peak file, the, the, the bed file that has been provided is, uh, is of a, uh, has a proper content. And then uh, Homer will extract sequences to the gen uh, from the genome corresponding to the regions in the imp input file. So uh, for in my bed file for the uh, specific chromosome and start stop positions, it will try to uh, it, it, it will get the the, the, the genomic sequences uh, for the relevant reference genome and try to identify um, the um, uh, try to identify motifs. So once the sequence is extracted, it's got calculate CPG, uh, CG, uh, GC and CPG content. Uh, it will pre-parse the genomic sequences of the selected sites. You, you you can can basically specify the the genomic sites uh, window. That needs to be uh, to be used for for the analysis. And if you look at the Homer documentation, they, they basically like for different type of analysis, they will recommend a different window size. It will uh, randomly select background regions for motif discovery, uh, run some auto normalization, and then do the uh, do the the check for known motifs and try to find the novel motifs as well. So to uh, Two reports will be generated out of this. One is the uh, report on de novo motifs it has found, and the other one on uh, known motifs that already exist in its database. Okay, now jumping to uh, goal term enrichment. So we can look at the biological significance of, of peaks for a given uh, or, 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 or a list of regions. Uh, in 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 a in a bed file using the gene ontology uh, annotations. 
So gene ontology, Go, is a set of structured uh, control vocabulary for community use in annotating genes, gene products, and sequences. So the, the tool we'll use to do this, and there are other tools, but this one is called Great. It's an online tool. So like it's a, basically it's a, it's a website to which you connect and where you'll uh, upload a bed file and choose your reference genome and it will basically run the check in the background. So this is not a, a, a command line tool. And of course, being a, a public resort, the, the size of the bed files that you upload uh, has to be, uh, has to be uh, limited because uh, to, 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 to save on computation power and so on. This is just a few, uh, a few additional words about the uh, gene ontologies. So, um, uh, it, well, gene, uh, the ontologies uh, themselves are, are not uh, like controlled vocabulary. Like a controlled vocabulary would be, uh, for, for instance, uh, a list of terms in a, in a, for a specific domain that is, uh, that is uh, predetermined, but without necessarily any, uh, you don't necessarily have to have relationship amongst the term, whereas uh, an ontology uh, will give you for that domain, the list of term, but like uh, relationships between terms. So we have an example on uh, the, the chart here for, if I look for the, the goal term uh, 43299, which is a leukocyte degranulation, I, I, I can get and this is coming from the gene ontology web, uh, main website, but uh, you, you can you can see the relationship between this term and a bunch of other terms at the level of uh, molecular functions, uh, cellular components, biological processes. So, like it's in, uh, uh, gene ontologies allow uh, allow the gene ontology allow you to characterize uh, specific like uh, uh, well biological functions of a, of a of a uh, of what you're describing uh, a, a the, the 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 location on the, on the, on an organism and, and and so on so as well, as I was saying there's a main website for gene ontology and then like uh, you can explore that and there's a, a lot of uh, useful tool to establish relationship amongst terms and those things uh, so great is your might tool I was talking about previously. Once again, the input uh, for this tool will be a bed file with the regions of interest and ideally little else. So like um, uh, if the results uh, of, 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 uh, of, of great uh, seem like a, a little too vague or unsatisfying. Sometimes it, it can mean like, for instance, if you take a, a file that's uh, representing a, that that has a lot of peaks over the whole genome, well, it's difficult to establish. Uh, like, if you have peaks everywhere, like it's difficult to to establish that uh, uh, there's some specific uh, um, uh, go terms that, that 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 belong to 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 your request. So uh, it's it's good to uh, to maybe do some some kind of cleanup first. Uh, the output will be the matching goal terms for the molecular function, the biological processes, the phenotypes, etc. Uh, you have we have an example below with a, a ChIP-seq histone uh, H3K27 AC experiments. So we took the peaks and we run this uh, like the sample, the biological sample was a, a bone marrow sample. Uh, so running this gives us a, a, a bunch of biological processes in which this is involved. And it seems to be matching well with the type of sample that I submitted. H3K27AC being a, uh, an enhancer, an active en enhancer, as we've said before. Okay, now I'll uh, give a little note because we will be using in the lab uh, a couple of times uh, the, uh, the set of uh, UCSC utilities. So um, in the other labs up to now, like you, you've generated the uh, like, uh, 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 bed files and, and and we've seen the we've, we've seen the content uh, of, of bed file previously in the in the slides but uh, like from public resources often what you will obtain is uh, uh, big bed files or big wig files so these are uh, basically binary indexed versions of the the bed files or the wiggle files that that, that, that you could generate 
So the and this is like for uh, space efficiency, and it's also for like uh, uh, well making these 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 these, uh, these annotations usable in tools across the internet. So uh, the uh, the formats were originally developed for the UCSC genome browser, uh, and and what it what it allows you being binary indexed files, it allows you to stream portions of a genomic file over the internet for visualization in a browser uh, that could be located at another place that that your file is located. So. There's a lot of, uh, of tools that are interesting for doing manipulation between file formats, uh, uh, such as a, a bed graph to big wig, uh, bed to big bed, and big bed to bed, etc. Uh, these tools have been uh, pre-installed in your AWS instance, so um, so you will be able to to use them all uh, during the uh, the lab part. Uh, some examples I include here are a big bed to bed, which allows you to convert a binary indexed bed file to a ASCII, like a text formatted uh, bed file. Uh, bed graph to big wigs all allows you to take it a, a text file that's a bed graph that one of such has been uh, generated in lab four with, uh, with Hector uh, uh, previously. And you can convert that to a big wig format which can be visualized in uh, online browsers, such as the UCSC genome browser. Uh, <clears throat> you have a bigwig merge, which allows you, for instance, let's say you have a multiple bigwigs, you'd like to merge them for whatever reason, like if, if you have a signal tracks that you want to put together, you can use this to merge file together. Uh, bigwig info uh, gives you some basic information about your file, and sometimes that's useful to assess uh, why a big wig file is not uh, is not behaving properly. Like what I have in mind there is like, for instance, like a, we were analyzing data from multiple big wig files, and like uh, one of them was uh, was uh, not behaving nicely. And by by checking the uh, the information on the file, we realized that uh, only uh, there's a bunch of chromosomes that were missing from the file. So. <laughs> um, Okay, for this section, I'll, I'll, I'll just finish with by giving a few examples of integrative analysis efforts. Uh, like there's a, a lot of, a, there, there are many large scale consortia that take epigenetic, epigenomic data from uh, multiple types of assays, such as methyl seq, such as, uh, well, whole genome by sulfate sequencing, uh, RNA seq, uh, histone and chip seq assays, and, and, and so on, and try to. Uh, to uh, answer uh, biological questions out of this one of this one of these being the NIH roadmap and as uh, Martin talked about previously uh, within the international human epigenome consortium there's currently the uh, the epi atlas effort which is uh, uh, which has taken all of the data sets produced by all members of the IHEC and and uh, Reanalyzing them together to uh, make uh, to to make uh, to even out the, the I guess the uh, the rough edges of like uh, data raw data set being processed by different groups and not being able to uh, to to um, to analyze them together. So um, so IHEC is preparing currently a uh, a gold standard data set if you want of a thousand of submitted epigenomes and they have been standardized and they have been uh, processed analyzed in in standardized ways this in this include uh, the uh, the uh, metadata being able uh, being even out a little bit you know like uh, some, sometimes Sometimes a group uh, is talking about uh, B cell, and another group is talking about B cells with an S. And those kind of like, there's a lot of wrangling of the uh, of the uh, metadata that's involved in there as well. And uh, a, a a group with an AP atlas has spent a lot of time uh, evening things out across groups. So it will offer a, a method to ease the access to the raw data. It, Hopefully, it will. It should improve the overall experience of accessing and analyzing IHEC data, and this should be coming out in uh, in spring two thousand twenty four. So, working with public data sets.
So as I was mentioning before, uh, large consortia such as IHEC uh, are uh, offering data sets from multiple tissues, from multiple disease, from multiple conditions, phenotypes, etc. Um, they're offering them uh, for the scientific community to use in their own research. And these resources are generally free and can be used in anyone's project. Uh, the public the public data sets, one, that, that's one, one, one caveat, I guess, is, is that like public data sets have a various uh, variable levels of quality. Uh, the metadata, uh, the annotations on the data set uh, can uh, have a variable level of, uh, uh, of, of, uh, of quality as well, I guess. <laughs> and, and, and those things. So that, that, that's something to, to keep in mind. Um, and then I'm offering a, a few examples of. Uh, large-scale initiatives that that are providing uh, epigenetic data sets online for uh, for anyone to use in their project. One of them being the Roadmap Epigenomic Project, the Encode Consortium, uh, which is uh, now uh, pr pretty much over. The, the, uh, but uh, uh, the, the, the uh, Encode Four uh, part of the of the uh, project has put several thousands experiment of ep epigenetic experiments available and completely uh, free to, uh, freely accessible like uh, so uh, these are downloadable for, from their website for anyone to use uh, the gtech projects is, is is interesting because uh, it's uh, providing uh, like uh, transcriptomic data but it also provide uh, like a uh, variance on uh, like the, the genomic data on the given sample, so and they also provide tools to uh, to explore essentially the, the interaction between variants on the genome and the level of expression for uh, for specific uh, genes. Uh, human data set, uh, uh, human cell atlas is a another uh, another important source. That's it, like uh, another uh, another of these uh, consortia of like many different groups that are just agreeing together to use a specific set of standards to annotate their data and make it available through a resources a resource such as the HCA. And of course there's the International Human Epigenome Consortium, which is one of the most complete epigenomic resources. Um, it is an international effort with several funding agencies. So like it's uh, like each country or set of country uh, uh, has are or have been part of IHEC at some point in the, the countries you, you see here. So there's a in Canada we have the we have the CERC. Uh, in US there was a encode and roadmap which were which were, were part of the initiative. In Europe we had the blueprint and the, the deep consortium. Uh, in, in in Asia we we had the uh, Crest, uh, KNIH, and then I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting a few, but uh, there's um, uh, the, the uh, these reference epigenomes that uh, IHEC is working on have are the the, the fruit of a uh, multiple uh, members. So IHEC is uh, um, is is a like a, a consortium of consortia internationally, as I said, and it provides standardized uh, reference epigenomes for a variety of normal and disease tissues. And there have been at different points in time, different committees or, or, or working groups uh, working on given standards, such as uh, uh, what is, uh, like in the beginning, I remember this discussion on what are the the proper ways of re running a, a chipseq assay, what, is, what kind of coverage should be offered. Uh, in terms of ecosystem, it's like how uh, how do you annotate the data, like uh, with uh, like a, a metadata schema for like describing your donors, describing your biological samples, describing the experiments that were run on these samples. Uh, as a, a group on ethics, uh, is it not, nowadays the, the most active active group is the integrative analysis group, which is working on the API Atlas.
It looks like David froze. Is it frozen for anyone else? Yes, it looks like he's frozen for me too. Okay. Um, I'll send him a message separately to let him know that maybe his connection is down. Give me a few seconds. Yes, he seems to have dropped out of the call. So while we wait for him to come back, does anyone have any questions? Anything there? Oh, he looks like he's back now. Yeah, sorry for that. I I don't know why Zoom cut, but uh, yeah. Uh, any, any questions uh, so far uh, before we before I continue? Otherwise, I'll just share my screen again. Okay, uh, and, uh, I had a question about the uh, yes. great tool. Um, so it seems like most of the uh, descriptions on your slides were related to uh, Go analysis, but it, does great have the ability to give granularity at a per gene level in terms of regulators, or would you advise against something like that? If I was interested in like specific interactions with gene, like a specific gene of interest, would you say, uh, I don't know about using great, maybe use something else? Oh, it's a good question. Like one thing I one thing I can answer is, is that like you could decide if if what you're interested in is uh, like specific region or specific genes to like submit bed files that are specific to the things that are interesting to you. But uh, probably uh, maybe maybe some someone else uh, who's uh, know, knows about a, a um, a resource that they use for these types of analyses. Okay. Um, so one, one thing to mention also is, is that like to answer a question, like you have a gene in mind and uh, you're interested in their, their interactions with like, yeah, specific biological and process and those things. Uh, the, uh, the information can, uh, the, there's a bunch of tools online to do this kind of exploration as well. And uh, gene, the gene ontology resorts, I believe has a, a way to explore biological processes that are involved with a specific gene of interest. So this is something that you, you could be looking into. Right, I'll, uh, I'll have a look uh, in those resources. Thanks, David. Right, you're welcome. All right. Okay. Um, so, so I, I'm not sure exactly where the uh, the, the slides cut. Did did, did did I reach um, did I reach this already or? You were there. All right. I, I was there. Okay. So, so as I was saying, the um, uh, IHEC uh, has this concept of full reference epigenomes, which means I take a biological sample, whether it's a piece of tissue, whether it's a a, a a cell line, a, a primary, a specific primary a type of primary cell, like B cells, T cells, etc. And and uh, uh, so basically, it, members are taking these types of samples and characterizing them over a bunch of uh, over a bunch of sp uh, epigenetic assays, uh, including whole genome bisulfide sequencing, RNA seq, and six chip seq uh, histone marks. And also providing uh, input to be able to uh, have on peak calling and so on. Uh, a couple of words on IHEC uh, data integration and sharing strategy. As I said, uh, IHEC is a, a consortium of consortia, which means uh, it doesn't have a centralized um, uh, data coordination center that will receive raw data from the various group and just like merge them and analyze them together. Uh, basically, the way it works is each of these gray boxes is a different uh, data production group that submits their own data to data repositories. Uh, in some cases, it's at uh, the EGA. Uh, at some some cases, it's DDBJ, DBGAP, and and so on. Like in the cases of uh, data sets like Encode, as I was mentioning, like uh, this is fully open data. 
uh, without any, without the restrictions on on the, like um, having to request access or those things. Whereas for given this is human data uh, and and considered very sensitive uh, data because of that, uh, a lot of the consortia have decided to uh, put their data under a controlled access repository. Uh, these are uh, some uh, some example here, uh, EGA and, 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 and um, EGA and the DDBJ. So the data is deposited in in, in those repositories. It, it is then um, processed using standardized uh, standardized data processing pipelines. Uh, each group, like although there had been some discussions on like the, what kind of pipeline should be used for for which situation and those things, each group have been like using pipelines that were that were seem relevant for, for for them to use which means the process data has been uh, 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 prepared a little bit differently uh, it's more or less it, it it talks the same thing but you can by we've seen over the years that like it can mean that there are some uh, artifacts some biases uh, in the process data, the big beds and the big wig files that are due to the differences in the way the data has been processed. But so this data, uh, nonetheless, is is uh, the public, the fully publicly accessible portion of the data that's being produced uh, in IHEC. Therefore, uh, that's the data that's being taken and organized in a data portal, uh, the IHEC data portal that we will cover uh, today as well. And then users are requesting, uh, are, 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 are going to that portal to discover the data that's being made accessible through IHEC. And once data sets of interest have been uh, identified, let's say you're interested in, uh, in all, uh, all brain epigenetic samples, uh, epigenetic assays run on all brain samples that are available in IHEC, then uh, a data access request can be placed to the proper data access committee. Uh, these processes are usually like, like just a, ma a matter of, couple of a, a couple of weeks to get acceptance. And once once a, a research project, project has been approved, data can be downloaded from resource, resources such as the EGA. Uh, IHEC is also uh, uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, nest maybe if I can say of, of many uh, tools that have been developed by its various members um, and some of some of them are for data discovery at the level of visualization at the level of data analysis and those things and I, I invite you to uh, have a look at these tools um, now going back again a, a little bit on the data being made available by HEC um, there's what I talked about previously that is the the, the public data that's these are the annotation track, the process data that's uh, that's uh, uh, fully accessible on IHEC servers and that, that are explorable using uh, browsers such as uh, the UCSC Genome Browser, such as Ensemble, or you can even download the tracks on <laughs> on your server if you want to visualize them with IGV. Uh, some metadata that's uh, deemed uh, publicly distributable on donor samples and library. Um, so anything that's considered non-personally identifiable is uh, is uh, distributed on the open on the IHEC website. And uh, yeah, again, this is freely downloadable. Um, for everything regarding the raw data, so the uh, the uh, the raw output from uh, the from sequencers. Uh, this is uh, deemed the uh, personal uh, personally identifi identifiable information. Therefore, with a few exceptions, uh, th this data is placed on a co controlled access repository such as EGA and dbGaP. And then, if you want to access the data, you have to follow the process I mentioned before. Moving on to challenges with analysis of uh, public data sets. So using online data sets of interest, once they've been identified, can, uh, as I mentioned, bring its share of challenges. One of those challenges is, uh, well, first, as I said, you, you have to, uh, to uh, apply to obtain access. 
uh, I'm putting this chart here because like it, it, it was an example of just within IHEC, you know, you have all of these data producing consortia and each of them have uh, specific requirements in terms of what they expect research project to, to do or to be able to provide in order to be accepted to, act, to uh, obtain the data. So like getting data for the IHEC as a whole uh, uh, used to be like a, a little bit of a challenge. This is one of the great things that's coming ahead with the EPF last data set is that uh, this is all like, a, this is an obstacle that, that, that we, uh, we tried to uh, to um, to uh, um, to remove when trying to uh, use the uh, IHEC data sets. So transferring data from the repository, um, like obviously like data download can be a very long endeavor. I'm saying up, uh, sometimes up to several months. It's not because like transferring very large amount of data can be, uh, can be uh, slow uh, on, on on your side, <laughs> on the downloader side. It's just, it's just the fact that like, sometimes like in the case of IHEC, if you have uh, over a hundred terabytes that are located on EGA server, uh, the, uh, the the burden, uh, the, 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 uh, the the slow side, it can, can often be uh, the data servers themselves. So. Comparing data sets across projects, uh, like, as I said, like metadata is often hard to collate across projects because it's not been collected and organized and harmonized in the same way. Uh, the way to describe an experiment in, I don't know, the human cell atlas project versus a data set that I identified at, at the at geo uh, can be can, can be very different in, in one case, but this the Experiment the molecule, the 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 the, the biosample uh, sorts, and those things are super well explained. In other cases, it is less. So if you try to analyze all of this together, uh, sometimes you'll come out with the little surprises. Um, experimental methods for given assays are not always the same. Uh, the, uh, the the results have variance, uh, varying levels of depth and quality, and so on. And um, of course, the, the last challenge is that analyzing large data sets on local resources can be uh, uh, very intensive in terms of, uh, of processor, in terms of memory, in terms of a storage space. It's usually, not, unless we're talking about really small data sets, that's something that you can usually do on your, on your own laptop. Uh, fortunately, there are uh, a lot of uh, resources existing nowadays to help uh, with this issue. One of them being, of course, commercial so solutions such as AWS that you are using in this workshop. Uh, in Canada, there's also the Digital Research Alliance of Canada that can provide um, access to uh, compute clusters that can uh, that are very powerful and allow you to uh, run these large scale analyses on, uh, on, on powerful computers that you could not do otherwise. Uh, this is a, 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 a free resource that's being made available to Canadian researchers. So if you're in Canada and running research and you don't know about the, the Digital Research of Alliance of Canada, I suggest that you, 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 you look at that. Um, so I talk about challenges. Uh, I can talk quickly about the uh, IHEC initiatives to help with some of these challenges. Um, first of all, for the API Atlas project, um, one thing, so I mentioned earlier that like the uh, process data that's on you know, the IHEC data portal has been processed by different pipelines in different ways. Um, what the API Atlas project has done is downloading all of the data from all of the mem member consortia and 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 uh, centralize it in one repo to analyze it together okay and 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 then the data analysis has been done using uniformized data analysis pipelines i include if in case you're curious the uh, the url to the three pipelines that have been used to process the chipseq the rna seq and the whole genome bisulfide sequencing uh, data and then once all of this is done, uh, there's this gold standard that's coming ahead, uh, harmonized uh, metadata um, and, and access, 
once this is uh, finalized, the process data will be uh, uh, will have been same pipeline those things, so it should be even more comparable than it is now. And this release will also be put on the IHEC data portal. So this will most likely be uh, the next uh, release for the IHEC data portal. Uh, there's also the uh, AP Share project, which is a, um, a a project that ran in the last couple of years, aiming to standardize. Uh, 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 to uh, improve standards and methods to share and discover AP, available AP genomes. So there's things such as uh, they developed uh, an, an infrastructure of nodes to, uh, to, to share data sets and to securely store the data. Um, it can, and and, and uh, the, also uh, it has worked on uh, data analysis containers that can be uh, uh, executed at the storage uh, data storage location. I can talk quickly about uh, the uh, APVAR browser, which was uh, one such project developed within APShare. Basically, uh, what we did is um, allowing users, like as, as I said, the, the, the genomic and epigenomic data, it's super large data sets. It's very, uh, uh, like these large data sets can be like cumbersome to, to centralize at the same place and analyze to ask you questions. So we built an online tool that allows you to explore the, uh, the effect of given variants on a set of epigenetic features. Like for instance, I, I give an ex example in the screenshot, I give a specific uh, variant of interest. And then um, for, uh, for this variant on a given data set, uh, I'm looking at a bunch of epigenetic assays and I'm looking at uh, over the whole genome, does it seem like uh, this variant has a specific effect on this epigenetic feature? Uh, the data set that has been, that is represented on the APVAR browser is uh, like, uh, it's connected to a, a bundle of publication that is just about to get released, uh, but the resource is avail already available online. Um, and what, so uh, this data set is about uh, flu infection. Uh, so you have like um, the uh, data set is on, on a non-infected non versus a flu infected uh, patient uh, uh, for two uh, population groups, Af African-American versus uh, uh, European-American. And based on your, uh, your genotype for the specific allele, you can see whether uh, like uh, uh, the, the, so the, the, therefore like you can see the effect of your your uh, your genotype for this specific variant on different epigenetic features. Uh, next, I can talk quickly about the path because like um, so so handling epigenetic and genomic data, as I said, for, for human patients is, is a, like, there's a lot of considerations to take in mind, right? Uh, like even like it can go all the way to uh, in Europe, you know, like there's the GPDR that can uh, affect the, what you can do and not do with a patient's data. Uh, if, if, you're, uh, if, if your uh, patient is of European origin. Um, so like, it, what DPAD does is basically uh, based on uh, like uh, a couple of questions that it's asking you. It it will tell you what are your uh, the, what are your your the responsibilities and precautions you should be taking with while while handling uh, epigenetic epigenetic data on your server, especially if you're building tools, all of this and those things. Like, what are the responsibilities that you should be taking? So the, this tool is available online. It's just like, as I said, you answer a couple of questions and it would, tells you uh, what is the accountability? Uh, what are the security features that you, should have, that you should take into account when storing and handling that data um, and, and those kind of things. Uh, I'm, Hector just mentioned about, about this at the end of his lab, uh, but there's a, a there's a lot of uh, bioinformatics analysis pipelines that are available in the open, GenPipes being one of them. The reason why I'm talking about this is because um, I, I get a question uh, uh, once in a while, and, and we talked about this in the social uh, last night as well, uh, is like people, uh, people are wondering, so 
in the labs, we've seen all these tools, the, the software, like, and, and, and we follow all these steps one after the other. But, but when you guys have these large data sets and you analyze them, like, do you apply these steps one by one and then check the output and then put it in the next, next one? And uh, the, the answer to that is no, because it will be way too uh, labor intensive. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and these are tasks that are very automatable. And this is what bioinformatics analysis pipelines do. Uh, one example being uh, gen pipes, uh, but there, there are uh, like a, a lot of other options. Uh, and and the, these uh, these options are offering epigenetic assay, uh, epigenetic data analysis pipelines for RNA seq, for chip seq, for bisulfite sequencing, and, and and so on. Uh, what's what I find interesting about gen pipes is the fact that um, if you are on Compute Canada or or or, or digital research, uh, digital research alliance of Canada, uh, like. And you, you're using one of their uh, their uh, super clusters. Uh, all of the tools and the pipeline themselves are al already installed there. So it's a matter of uh, configuring the pipelines for the, what you want them to do, and you're already good to go. So this is something that you can have a look at if you're using uh, Beluga, if you're using Seder, if you're using Graham, uh, Narval, and so on. Okay, uh, last word, maybe on the quality controls of epigenetic, epigenetic data sets. Uh, we've talked generously about the fast QC already. Uh, there's, it's just to say that there's, there's a bunch of tools that allow you to uh, assess the quality of data that you would find online. Because as I said, it can be of uh, variable levels of quality. I'm just taking like uh, two tracks that uh, could uh, used to be uh, findable in, in uh, online resorts. And then you, you look at, uh, like, if you look at the, 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 the signal you get on these, uh, these ChIP-seq uh, experiments, like, uh, they, like they, they seem very, very different in terms of, uh, of output. So um, my, the message I want to communicate here is that, like, the data you find online, uh, it's, it's, it's especially for, like, a, like something's produced by a smaller consortium, uh, it, it's good to try to, to uh, run some level of quality check on it. And uh, Martin already talked about the FRIP score as a, as a way to assess the quality of a gypsy experiment. Um, on the IHEC data portal, we'll cover that later. There's a, uh, there's a tool to assess the, uh, the uh, to run, to give you a, a kind of a, um, uh, Correlation matrix, sorry, of on 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 data sets of interest that that, that you would select. Uh, so we'll we'll cover that in the lab. Um, IHEC is working on 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 the, well, has been working and has published a, a recommendations on the uh, on the set of a quality control matrix that you can use to assess each of the, the quality of each of uh, your types of epigenetic assays. Uh, can, I, I see the time, time is flying. I have about 10 minutes, so I'll, I'll, I will go a bit uh, quicker. But uh, like Chrome Impute is this tool that was developed by uh, Manalis, Manalis Killis uh, groups uh, before that, that, that allows, and mostly developed by J Jason Erst, um, which allows you to generate impute, imputed annotation tracks for samples using training data. So let's say you have a, a, a sample uh, on, on a specific blood tissues, like, like maybe B cells. And then you have data, other uh, data sets that are B cells as well. And uh, you have uh, uh, multiple experiments around on H3, K K27AC. You can use these to impute for your sample a track of what your epigenetic experiment should look like. And then there's tools within that allows you to see how different your track is actually from the expected track. And that, I guess, it, it, it's one way that could be used to, uh, to assess the quality of your track as well. Um, so now we uh, we talked a lot about the, 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 these resources, we, how to find them, uh, how to uh, obtain the data, analyze it. And, 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 and uh, there's a lot of tools that exist online to help you with your data analysis, your 
quality assessment and those kind of things. So in the, the time we have remaining, we will uh, cover some of these tools. So, uh, okay, well, I'll, I'll start quickly by talking about the IHEC data portal, which is the place to obtain the uh, epigenetic information, uh, the epigenetic data produced by IHEC. So, uh, as of October 2020, that's the latest bill that has been produced. And as I said, there's another one coming ahead. Uh, you can find over 10,000 human data sets. Uh, over, and you can find over 1,000 mice and primate data sets as well. There is 450 full reference epigenomes that are available and data set from eight consortia. So the goal of the portal, as I mentioned earlier, is to uh, make available and organize the publicly accessible data portion of the IHEC data set. So the raw data is in controlled access repositories, such as EGA and DBGAP. So it offers the tool for data sets discovery, visualization, and pre-analysis. Uh, we'll, we'll cover like the exploration of the, the data on IHEC within the lab. Uh, as I said, the uh, the portal includes a data, a data set correlation tool that allows you to establish with an IHEC, how similar a data set of a specific assay uh, would be with uh, like a, another data set maybe of the same assay, for instance. So the uh, data set correlation allows you to uh, see, uh, potentially identify outliers and uh, similarity across groups. There's a tool to download the, uh, the process data and we will use that in the lab to obtain some big beds and big wigs that are that will be that will be used in your analysis. Um, the tracks are all served on the IHEC data portal locally. Uh, the the reason for that is that like as time passes, uh, consortia come and go. Uh, the existence of servers and their organization changes. So to offer some level of standardization, at some point the IHEC data portal centralize all of the epigenetic tracks from each of the consortia and uh, makes them available on the portal. Uh, the portal has a per this concept of permanent session, which means basically that you can uh, uh, select a data set of interest and you can share it with, uh, with collaborators and say like, this is, what I, this is what I use for my analysis. You can generate a unique ID and, uh, and reuse that. And there's a, there's a a feature for a session reports, which allows you to see all of the metadata that's available for a specific sample. I want to talk also about the ENCODE portal, which has really well organized its thousands, several thousands uh, of, of experiments uh, on the, a whole bunch of epigenetic assays going from, from the data you can find in a heck, like his histone chip seek, like um, uh, RNA seek, and so on, and, and, and a whole bunch of other assays, such as ATAC seek, transcription factor binding sites, uh, chip seek, um, and, and so on. Uh, so this this portal allows uh, offers uh, different faceting tools to identify data sets of interest based on the um, based on the organism, based on the assay, best based on the biological sample, and so on. And uh, it also includes links to visualization in public browsers. Uh, just a few words on the ChipSeq Atlas, which is a resource that uh, scraped a lot, <laughs> a lot of online resources for completely publicly accessible experiments. So Chip, uh, the Chip Atlas includes 375,000 publicly accessible such experiments. Uh, the level of chick seek, DNA seek, ATAC seek, biosulfide sequencing, and so and so on. And uh, you can use their resorts to run some level of exp exploration. Like there's this nice little peak browser there that can generate bed files that can uh, that you can use in your in your IGV browser, for instance. Uh, you can also uh, get links to where the data is deposited if you want to use it. Like in in this case. Uh, there's a bunch of data being deposited at Geo, so you can uh, you, uh, you you can get links to download it there. Uh, the GTEx portal we talked about uh, GTEx uh, previously is another place where you can download the data produced by the the GTEx uh, project. 
uh, UCSC Genome Browser, we've talked about this and it's been covered by other labs already, but it, it offers a, a, it's like probably the most used uh, genome browser online to visualize tracks for genomics data and epigenomics data. Uh, there's a way to, if you want with collaborators, you want to ex you want to exchange a, like a, a set of data sets that are relevant to, to your project. Uh, you can use a track hub, which is basically a list uh, of uh, of tracks, their location on the internet. So like when you visualize data on the USCC genome browser, the tracks that are here are not available, are not on the server of the USCC genome browser. They're located elsewhere, for instance, on the IHEC data portal. And the way to visualize the data on the UCSC genome browser is to create a data, a, a, a track hub, which is a list of tracks that exist somewhere on the server and some metadata to organize it in the browser. So uh, maybe I'll, 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 I'll skip over this, but this is a small uh, track hub example. So basically there's a, there's a standard and it's well explained on the website of how to organize your tracks for a UCSC genome browser session. Uh, there's obviously like uh, other browsers that exist for visualization, such as the WashU epigenome browser. Um, I can talk quickly about uh, about this tool, the, which is called EpiGee, just because this is what uh, generated the correlation scores in the IHEC data portal. So EpiGee is a pipeline that looks at IHEC data, and it also allows you to upload uh, your own data, and you can assess the similarity of your track. Uh, based uh, on uh, uh, tracks of uh, the same assay or of the same cell type. Uh, with uh, So you can compare your data with IHIC data using it. And then you can generate a correlation matrix, matrices uh, of your data uh, with IHIC data. Um, time is almost, <laughs> time is running out. Uh, so I'll just talk quickly also about data sharing because like one, it's, it's one thing to generate data in your research project, you'll uh, you, so you'll have raw data, but you'll have processed data, and you you will want at some point to share it with collaborators who will have a look at it and those things. So one interesting thing, and so there's this only online tool called GenApp, uh, which allows you to generate uh, uh, what you call a data hubs. A data hub is just a, a an open space on the web where you can drop tracks such as big beds and big wigs, you can deposit them there and you can share a link with a collaborator, password protected or not, that's that's for you to, to, to decide. And uh, you can, uh, so you can put your your uh, your analysis results on it. You can sh share result, uh, reports and those things and you can share them with collaborator. Uh, it, it used to be a Canadian, uh, Canadian research, uh, Canadian academia only. It's now open uh, to uh, um, international academia. So you, what you need to do is just uh, you register, whether it's uh, with a Google account. Uh, there's different ways to, to to register, but once you're in, you can create a space. You get, uh, I think it's what. 250 gigabytes or something, uh, you can uh, start uploading your data there and, and, and generate links to share with others. Uh, I'll just say a few words about Galaxy quickly in the, the time that's remaining. Uh, G Galaxy is a, an online portal and we, uh, I, I'm talking about this also because we uh, I discussed with some of the students at the, uh, the social yesterday and, and at, at other occasions and one thing per some, some time that, that we're being asked is like, a, so all of these tools that you're running on a command line on those things, like, is there a way, is there a tool online? Uh, is, is there a, a, a user interface that would allow me to run these tools? And the answer is yes. There's, a, the, there's this platform called Galaxy, which has the vast majority of the tools that for instance, we've covered in the past two days and a half in the labs and those things, running FastQC, running alignments, calling peaks, uh, etc. So like uh, this tool, uh, Galaxy, this uh, framework, Galaxy, allows you to do that. Basically, uh, you can uh, set up workflow, analysis workflows, and you can, uh, uh, you or you can uh, uh, run tools uh, by the piece to run specific analysis on your data using a web interface. So I'll just give you an example, uh, uh, which is usegalaxy.org. Uh, this is a, you, you need to register, but it's uh, completely free. 
it gives you 250 gigabytes of space for your analyses. So what you can do, you can start with your raw data, your fast queues that you obtain from your experiments. You can up upload them there and you can run uh, tools, as I said, like fast QC alignment and so on. Uh, for um, You can analyze them on that portal. And uh, well, of course, heavier jobs will put, be put in a queue, so you might have to wait for a little while. But it it is a it is an interesting solution. And one thing I really like with Galaxy, okay, and, and one thing that uh, we we uh, never emphasize enough is that when you run a, a genomic or epigenomic analysis, um, it's very important to keep track of the steps that you've done to analyze your data. Uh, the reason for that is that is well, one one reason is for reproducibility. Let's say. Uh, you run your, your very nice analysis and you've been working for months on something and then you reach the result in the end and you haven't written written down anything of what you've done. Uh, it's a bit like a lab book, right? Like, like you, you want to reproduce your result, uh, you might have a really hard time to do so. Um, so that's why it's always recommended to, uh, whether you run stuff on common line or anything like to, to to keep a uh, to keep a journal to keep a log of what uh, what you've been doing in terms of analysis, um, and and that's one interesting thing I, I like from Galaxy is that there's on the, on on the right here there's this history of everything you've done with your data, like uh, which tools you ran on them, uh, which what did you use as an input, what are the parameters that you gave to the software and those things, so you have this log that's kind of like there for you if you need to extract it at some point. And that's one, one so I am giving an example of a fast QC here, but one thing that's interesting is, is that once you've reached this, uh, this series of steps that you like, and then you want to reapply it to other samples, you can extract recipes and create workflows out of them to reapply them to others, to uh, other data sets. So maybe again, and, I'll, I'll just uh, re-emphasize here what, what has been said earlier in the workshop, but for Galaxy, same as common line, uh, same as with command line tools, you have to know what you're doing. Uh, you can't just expect the default parameters of Galaxy or of command line tools uh, uh, of any sort uh, will be uh, exactly what you need for the analysis that you're, you're doing. You need to understand for each tool you're using, what are the parameters? Therefore, it's very important to read the doc. Um, so, so just, just to say, so like the, the lab we will do after the lunch break, uh, will, uh, will not be especially covering, uh, will not be covering galaxy, but I, inc I included an extra lab at the end of the, of the, uh, of the, uh, markdown document. Uh, so you, you can, once you're finished with the lab, there's a link you, you'll see at the end that links to an introduction to use galaxy.org. So you can use this to just create an account and up, upload a toy data set and then run some analysis and you, you'll, that will give you a feel of what Galaxy is doing. Because like Galaxy in itself uh, is a, can be the subject of a, can be the topic of a, a, a workshop in itself that lasts two, three days. So like there's a, just so many options of what you can do. So in conclusion, uh, what we've done in this module, we've covered examples of downstream analysis tools, how to obtain publicly accessible data sets, the challenges of using these public data sets, and uh, uh, we've covered some uh, online resources to obtain data, to run analyses with the web interface. So the lab will, uh, will be uh, covering some of these, uh, some of these uh, tools that we've talked about over the last hour.